history is haunted. I know, that's how I want to start this TED Talk. It has to be the scariest thing that is out there. And if you do not believe me, you can go to the right now, go on the internet and search top 10 haunted sites in my city. These lists will go on and on and they will make you believe that everybody from the other world, all the supernatural entities of the netherworld, from the ghosts to the witches to the demons to the jinn, all um, come and reside and find their refuge in historical monuments, in heritage sites, in forts and fortresses, in tombs and lodges. Let me give you an example of Delhi. In the 14th century hunting lodge, Malcha Meher, which is in the middle of a forest, you will be haunted by the ghost of a woman who died by crushing diamonds and swallowing them. At least that's where the legend goes. If you go to Jamali Kamali's tomb in the Hadali Archaeological Park, you will be left by this empty tomb known as the Jinn. These are creatures, they are smokeless fire. And if you test them, they're going to whack you across the face. However, if you go to Sarosha Kotla, there too you will find Jinn. That's where, if you behave right, we're going to bless you. Because the jinn of Firosha Kutla are actually saints. But the most favorite ghost out of all of them is the one that is under, on the ridge of the North Campus of Delhi University. There is this colonial era monument there known as the Mutiny Memorial or the Mutiny Tower. Have any of you heard of it? Now, at this tower, which came in the aftermath of 1857, where is the ghost of a headless East India Company officer? He's a British ghost. And if you find yourself in the middle of the night walking around the ridge, he's going to come up, he's going to sneak behind you, and he's going to ask you a very, very important question in his British accent. He's going to say, Can you give me a light for my cigarette? Now, if you're not completely overtaken by fear, your first question will be, if this ghost is headless, where is this voice coming from? But a certain more important question that you should be asking is that if this ghost is headless, how is he going to smoke? Now, you see, it's very interesting that I have noticed the haunting of heritage sites does not really stop people from going to these places. Actually, the haunting of the region why many people go there. You know, news reports are made on it, documentaries are written down. Influencers force their friends to take their cameras with them and spend nights in 19th century graveyards in the spirit of finding a spirit. And in the process of all of this, getting slapped by it. I mean, you believe me when I tell you that there are some people out there who are so eccentric that they are even writing books on how haunted history is. I mean, there are people like that out there. They are who you have to believe me. I'm talking about myself. I am such an eccentric person uh, writing about ghosts. But that is for another TED Talk. In this TED Talk, I want to actually point out to you a very interesting phenomenon that I have noticed as I have gone from one monument to another searching for ghosts. I realized that it is not haunted monuments that scare people. What people are actually scared by is studying history. So quite literally, what should I mean like that's how I select that? And I would understand. I mean, this can be an intimidating subject. The enormity of it is quite daunting. It can be scary. And the base, you know, Tariq, the Tariq, the Tariq. The Tariq, the Tariq, the Tariq, but what if I tell you that the past is much more than what meets the eye? That history is not something that you should be scared of or that you have to be scared of. But before I tell you how, I have to tell you the story of my first love. It was related. I remember seeing her for the first time. She had the most gorgeously almond shaped eyes. Her hair is stylishly braided, always. Her stunning ornaments, I mean, the pendant is to die for. And the bangles, she wears more than 20 bangles in one arm. She is beautiful, she is grace. She puts one hand on her waist. Oh, and she is thousands and thousands of years old. I don't know if you can see on the screen, but this is the dancing girl. Just by a show of hands, have you seen her before? I'm not going to ask anybody. All right, where are a few hands? You must have met her in your history textbooks. 
Now, the dancing girl is made of this thing. Let me, known as a lost bad me. She is made out of bronze. And she comes to us from Mahindradaru. Not to be confused with the movie of Richard Russian in it, but actually the largest site from what we call the Indus Valley civilization or the Harappan civilization, or the more preferred term now, Harappan culture. And in its mature phase, or in layman terms, a period in which it thrives here in heat, was 2600 BCE to 1900 BCE. Now, the dancing girl may look quite large in this image, but in actuality, she is just 10.5 centimeters tall. She is kept at the National Museum in New Delhi. She is a very tiny figurine. And yet, for centuries, she has managed to captivate the attention of everybody who has a fascination with the past, who has a fascination with art, or anybody who possesses a love for history and its wonders. Now, as I said, she comes to us from Mahindradara, the Harappan civilization. And when I saw her for the first time, my entire view to this history completely changed. You know, nobody is born, perhaps, with a love for squaring its stones and digging graves. Neither was I. In school, actually, I found history to be quite dry and boring, like most of us, especially the Harappan civilization. And there were two primary reasons uh, behind this. First one being that it is so goddamn old, 5,000 years. It seems like it comes from such a distant land, and these geographies are sort of you know, beyond your comprehension. So it's underrated in that way. But secondly, it did not speak to me because it literally cannot. The Harappan script is on the south end. You haven't been able to decode what the Harappans were saying. So most of what we know comes to us from interpreting and understanding the tangible remnants that they have left behind in their vast geographies. So it was a dry civilization. I couldn't hear them. There was too much archaeology, too many layers to dig. And I thought, you know, this is not happening for me. But then I went to the museum and I saw her. And my first impression was, well, of course, what a sassy sculpture. I mean, she was like Regina George and Mohan But more than that, there was something in the sculpture that we don't understand the first time that we see it. You know, we go to the museum, we look at sculptures and paintings and objects and we think, all right, this is a sort of inventory of things from the past, just kept in boxes behind these glasses. There are these tabs that tell you which era they come from, which region they come from, and that's it. But there is much more to what these uh, there's much more to this culture than what meets the eye. For example, the dancing girl is not just a 10.5 centimeter tall bronze figurine from the Hinge of She is the representation of an idea. Behind her was a community of craftspeople. Behind her was the thought of a patron. Behind her was an economy that adapted to it, a society that accepted it. A quality that perhaps questioned it. The dancing girl is the manifestation of time itself. You see, we think Harappa is so distant, and yet it is right in front of you, standing in its 10.5 centimeters grey and bronze, speaking to you about the moves, the ideas, the crafts, the wonderment, the fascination, and the curiosity of a civilization that feels oh so distant, and yet it is right here. That is the magic of history, and of viewing history, your viewing time. I've seen something like this before. I've seen something like this elsewhere. There are more features to the Buddha. There is a rounder behind him. That's the halo, the sign of enlightenment. And then you go back to the robes and you think about the folds and you think, wait, I have this. And perhaps you're thinking about Greek and Roman sculptures. Maybe something like this, which is a Roman sculpture of the Greek goddess Athena. And now this quarter then leads you to another. You start to think, wait, Gandhara, Buddha, Greece, Rome, how are all of these things connected? And so you enter the corridor of region, you go to Gandhara, and then you enter the corridor of time. 
you go to the beginning of the common era and just before. And you realize that in Dandhara, there was a sea of cultures. There were so many ideas that, that this region witnessed. That it saw, it was a part of the Ecumenid Empire of Persia. It saw Chandragupta Maria and Alexander. It was also a part of Greek dynasts. And it then ended up becoming a part um, of the Kushans, this nomadic tribe originally from China that made their way to uh, Dandhara and soon even extended their influence to places like Mathura. And it was under the Kushans that the most recognizable images of the Buddha came to be, the ones that we know today. Because what they did was infuse lingering traditions of Greek ideas of art and mix them with our indigenous ideas of religion and art. So you begin to then realize that the most recognizable patterns, the most recognizable ideas, the most recognizable faces that you see around you all the time are results of processes that happened in the past, long, long, long ago. And yet, they're right there in front of you, making you want to hear history's call. Now, I do not also want to romanticize this so much. Of course, yet again, the study of the past is going to be difficult. But I do want to mention that when you hear the call of history, you will realize, realize that there is an innate fascination that we have with things of the past. It is when you see an object at a museum or when you see a monument and you then give a context and a backstory. That is what really unlocks your childlike curiosity and the wonderment that you have with the past. That is what unlocks the pleasure of history. And on the question of pleasure, have you heard of the ancient Indian text, the Tama Sutra? Of course, you have heard of the ancient Indian text, the Tama Sutra. You know, the Tama Sutra says that Tama is the consciousness of pleasure. And in, in its most general sense, it's understanding that you have five senses. And these five senses come in contact with objects of pleasure. And when these objects complement the senses, and this entire process is assisted by the mind and the heart or the soul, there is an awareness of pleasure, a consciousness. There is an overwhelming feeling, you know, whether you're seeing something or hearing something or tasting something. Now think about a time when you went to a historical monument and you were completely mind blown by the intricacy of its architecture. Think about the time you heard of a historical saga that spoke to you so evocatively, it stayed with you for days. Think about the time you looked at a painting of two lovers. And each brushstroke felt like it was an ode to love. That feeling of looking at history can be overwhelming. But again, let's not romanticize it so much. You see, the study of the past may record stories of love, of equality, of peace, but in equal measure, it is haunted by tales of conflict, war, violence, and oppression. The past is difficult because for the largest part of its own history, it has felt so many people feel left out of history. As if voices of women, of queer individuals, of the oppressed, simply did not exist and did not make it through time, compared to the Jews of footnotes of history. The past is difficult because more and more, it seems to be a battlefield, a quest to find the truth. The past and studying it is difficult, but it is not so black and white as right and wrong. It's gray. It has to be. It is complicated. It is our story at the end of the day. The saga of humanity, the multifaceted and checkered story of people. And it is these stories that we have the responsibility of preserving and telling and of drawing out wise models from them. You know, it, there is so much documentation of war, violence, conflict, and oppression in history, and I'm mean, able to come across it so often. Perhaps it is a wake-up call. It is not a complete to follow, but it is to tell you that, listen, it has been so easy throughout time for people to be wicked. So perhaps it's time for you to be kinder, to be empathetic, to be compassionate, to take the wiser call. So history makes you kinder. Because knowing each other's stories makes you more understanding. That is what we need. 
It was the day I began at astrology. Every single day of my life has been spent with history. I think that you know it better. You know, we have we've crossed the talking stage. And you see, history has taught me a lot of things. It has made me realize numerous things. It has made me realize that the world is complicated and that there are always going to be multiple perspectives. So listen, see, think, and observe. It has made me realize that studying it is going to be deeply difficult, but that it is worth all the effort. But most importantly, it has made me realize that it is also haunted, that we have nothing to be scared about. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, I want to take a question. Oh, yeah. so, yeah, yeah, Thank you.